Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affairs Test Series Test One Discussion. My name is Ashish Malik, and today we will be taking up the next twenty-five set of the questions. I am very sure you guys must have learned a lot of new things from the first two parts. So carrying that forward in the test in this part number three, we'll continue our discussion. I will also tell you in today's video how to approach any question, and also we'll take up. try to understand the level of the difficulty of the questions okay so let's get started with a big smile on our face and we are ready to learn a lot of new things so the question number 51 which was asked in your test is was about the national biopharma mission now this is a very important mission guys national biopharma is important because you see in the last 10 years or 12 years we have seen the government of india very dedicatedly they are they are focusing on the development of the biopharma sector and things got really really important specifically when we have seen the covid kind of pandemic right now even there is even more emphasis so in 2017 this particular mission was started by the government of india you were supposed to figure out which statements are the correct one the first statement says it is co-funded by the new development bank but that is a problem this particular initiative has nothing to do with the new development bank though implementation part is correct it is implemented by birak which is biotechnology research assistant council the problem is the first one that is the world bank has to be the right answer because see the new development bank is something which we associate with the brics okay in 2014 new development bank was constituted as a part of the brics brics council which india is a part of course but here it is it is the 50% funding co funding is 50% funding is given by the world bank implementation part is absolutely correct now also remember one thing about the birak birak is important and this particular mission is very very important because i'm sure you must have heard about the i3 initiative which 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 is about the innovate innovate in india it's a very important component innovate in india that you should also remember under this particular biopharma mission which which is all about promoting the entrepreneurship promoting uh, the manufacturing of the bio uh, pharma products in india right that is important now the now so the first statement is wrong the second said it focuses on the development of the product leads to uh, vaccine biosimilars and medical devices yes that second part is absolutely correct uh, there is no doubt about it so answer has to be b guys okay so level of difficulty i would say it's a medium kind of question it it is a, a medium level difficulty uh approach if in these kind of questions sometimes when when it is said that you know there is collaboration between the two always be little bit more careful i mean there is no difficulty guessing the second one but definitely there was a problem guessing the first one because you see you can't really guess the collaborations it it can be any collaboration if you are not 100% sure i would say don't take risk okay don't take take risk in such such kind of things don't go straight forward attempting it you have to wait you have to recall because there there are names of the uh, bodies which are involved okay important guys and the overall uh, uh, the budget of this mission was 1500 crore rupees out of which 50% to be given by world bank now the second question is again very very important question and it is about the direct seed seeded rice which is dsr method and you were supposed to figure out the right one the correct one first said it is a method of the sowing rice directly into the field you you see the name is also saying the same thing direct seeded rice i mean it is something which is directly uh, you know putting the seeds into the field so first statement looks quite okay instead of growing seedlings into the nursery and then transplanting them into the flooded fields now very very important uh, uh, this question guys because you know i'm sure we all have seen the pedi cultivation right the the very first thing that comes to our mind when we think of the pedi cultivation is the water logged farms you have a lot of water there and uh, one by one you have to plant transplant those uh, you know seedlings it's a very first picture that comes to our mind but of course that particular part uh, this is called the puddled transplanted rice this particular method is called the ptr method the puddled transplanted rice it is also mentioned here but there's a problem with this particular method we all know about it because uh, this method is responsible for lots of methane emission right it 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 is a lot of methane is emitted in those paddy fields in fact around 18 to 20% of the methane comes from this particular method 
So to uh, modify the technique to fix that one, which is which is the traditional method is this, but to replace it with a more uh, eco-friendly method, there is another method called the direct seeded rice. Now this direct seeded rice is something which is also called as the broadcasting seed technique. It is also this uh, uh, another name for this is broadcasting. It is also called the broadcasting seed technique. Okay, so simply that seed is put directly into the field and it is a better alter alternative to the PTR that is this statement is absolutely correct. Now if you know this much if you can decode this much rest of the two statements becomes really easy for you why Let, let's try to understand with the logic. Second statement says it reduces the demand for the labor water energy agrochemicals lower the greenhouse gas emissions from the rice cultivation particularly methane I told you. So yes this statement automatically will give you the idea there is nothing hard in this question I would say this question is of very easy level right and you should definitely approach these kind of questions but you have to solve this kind with a bit of common sense and third says you know it require more seed rate weed management of course you need more weed management more uh, you know lodging preventions of course you need a bit of a bit of more since this technology right now is also a very developing kind of technology uh, you need more management because normally comparatively to the PTR method the roots of the plant in this particular case are a bit weak so they need more care that is the only thing we have to take care of rest everything is fine so all three statements are correct answer has to be D but very okay kind of question very easy you can attempt it with the common sense okay I hope you got it the third statement was about the 53 question was about the National Green Tribunal NGT now out of this you are supposed to figure out the respective statements statement one was said that it's a specialized judicial body for environmental matters in India decisions are binding on all the parties yes that first statement is absolutely correct so all the environmental matters of India it is the green tribunal which is responsible in 2010 the government of India has instituted this national green tribunal dedicatedly for environmental matters but one thing is very important guys first of all this particular uh, uh, national uh, this green tribunal it's a judicial body it has powers of a civil court that is okay second important thing that you have to remember is the national green tribunal works on the just uh, it works on the principle of natural justice it takes into account the principle of the natural justice not it is not just bound by the rules which are there you know available in the country National Green Tribunal can go beyond those rules con considering the uh, principle of natural justice. So its jurisdiction and domains are quite broad. Okay. Now why I have I'm, I'm uh, mentioning this thing very specifically because National Green Tribunal decisions are binding but also take care that they are not final. Okay. Decisions are binding but that they are not final. In case if any party understand that you know there is some disparity like within 90 days within 90 days you can go and file your complaint with the supreme court decisions are binding but they are not final okay so that also you take care uh, thankfully this question is only saying about the binding what if the question would have been decisions are binding and final for all parties then this statement could have been wrong that's why i am specifically mentioning it they are not final okay uh, the first statement is correct okay second statement said it's a statutory body means uh, established by the act of parliament and that is also correct so there is nothing I mean very easy question uh, if you if you have even read once about the NGT you can solve it very uh, in a very easy convenient manner there is nothing more you can do about it very very important but at the same time quite easy also. Okay, one more one more interesting thing. The, the answer has to be A. Now, one more interesting thing is also with the NGT, and that is in case sometime it thinks the decisions that they have delivered are of some kind of you know there is some uh, uh, you know protest about it. There's some something wrong. They all they can also review their own decision. It's it is it is also one special power with the NGT, uh, with the NGT that they can review 
their own decisions as well that is again something which is there so make sure guys you attempt these kind of questions they are also easy you should not be uh, be you should not be worried about these kind of questions they are quite easy okay and now one one more thing uh, that you can you know learn from this uh, if in case if in case there is any kind of environmental damage and uh, if you know there is any anybody who complains about the damage and any matter that comes under schedule 1 the whole thing uh, you know these are the particular acts which are actually uh, covered by this particular ngt the national green tribunal okay so you have a list here you can read from the from the pdf the all these all important environmental laws are covered with, within the purview of the ngt that is again very very important guys okay now going forward with the question number 54 question 54 is about the official language of the india and you are you have to figure out which statement is correct so it says it says uh, the scheduled languages under the eight schedule can be used for legislative business in the parliament and state legislatures uh, now you have to be a little bit careful guys little bit careful in what sense because language is something that you should always you know you should be clear which are the constitutional languages we have which are the eight scheduled languages we have the first statement is correct there is no problem with that which are the scheduled languages which are under the eight schedule and in total there are 22 languages in india which are covered as a part of eight schedule right and yes in the parliament and the state legislatures we can use any of these languages there is absolutely no issue with that second statement is something that you should be careful about second statement says the constitution designated hindi as the official language of the union and the states no the states are not covered please be careful as per the constitution you can use the hindi is the official language of the union only only the states are not bounded by using hindi as the official languages the states can use any language any of these 22 languages or they can use that language which is not a constitutional one but if they if the that is their mother tongue they can still use it without any issue they just have to pass uh, that into the into the vidhan sabha right so please be very careful hindi as official language is only for the central government not for the state government so please eliminate simply if you are if you have a bit of common sense here if you if you read the statements very carefully try to apply the logic of the language politics in india you understand the statement two is absolutely incorrect by only eliminating two you will get your right answer as c one three and four third statement says the constitution of india empowered the parliament the president to appoint commission and committee on the official languages yes the president of india is empowered uh, if it is required it is there in the constitution you go to the article 344 go to the article 351 there they have clearly mentioned the president can make recommendation for the progressive use of the hindi and also the development of the other scheduled languages this kind of provision is there question number four the constitution of india allows the parliament to amend the eighth schedule by simple majority yes it is also correct what is a simple majority uh, uh, how many people are present and voting let's say there are total 200 member if uh, they are there so simple majority would be 100 plus 1 if you have only let's say 160 member present then it would be 80 plus 1 so simple majority always vary it is just the people present and voting always remember there are certain provisions of the constitution which are going to be amended only by the special majority a special majority is a bit complicated one where you where you need uh, the people present in voting and also there is minimum two third of the total strength of the house that is a separate case but as far as uh, amending the eight schedule is concerned it can be done simply by the simple majority so answer has to be c like i told you guys okay now and if if any language is going to be added further you have to track at least you should be aware which are the which are these 22 languages go google it and search learn about them you should be aware of the constitutional languages of our in of our constitution mentioned in schedule 8 very very important now question number 55 this question was about the electoral bonds very much in news since the time they uh, we have 
created the electoral bonds way back in 2017 onwards and still they are being criticized by the opposition parties they there is a lot of speculation about the electoral bonds so these are the these are kind of topics i always say they are evergreen topics doesn't matter uh, when you are preparing your exam these are the topics which are evergreen topics always keep appearing in your exams now here you have to here you are supposed to figure out which statement is correct about correct about the electoral bonds they are interest free bearer instrument now as the name suggests okay first of all focus on the name electoral bonds means what what do we what do we do in the bond bonds are the bearer instruments right like any other bond they are also the bond here anybody who purchases them we, this is a method of political funding in india this is the method the political funding you are giving some funds to your party that is a political funding okay so they are interest bearer instruments can be purchased by citizens yes they can be or body incorporated in in the country yes the two kind of buyers can be there one individual citizen like i can bear it i can also buy it and uh, if there is any body which is made uh, uh, by few number of people from india even that one particular body can also buy them but they can be bought only from designated branches of the spi that is also correct see i know normally these kind of words only all you know exclusive these are bit speculative terms but don't worry uh, as far as electoral bonds are concerned it is only the uh, sbi only state bank of india which is authorized to sell these kind of uh, you know electoral bonds that's that's uh, absolutely correct but you see you can't buy it any time you want <laughs> there is uh, also very special guidelines okay when uh, it is not available 12 12 months a year no i mean only in the month of january in the month of april uh, in the month of july in the month of october there is a specific 10 day window it it is specified by the uh, branches of the sbi and also not every branch of the spi there some special only special designated branches are there so there is a 10 day window anybody who wants to fund bjp aam aadmi party congress any any party that you want to fund you can go you can purchase them and simply deposit your money but there is another very important condition they are valid for 15 days from the date of the issue or they and and they must be encashed by the political parties only through the verified bank accounts and who verifies these bank account the election, uh, election commission of india every political party has to submit have to give details of their bank account to the election commission of india and every electoral funding uh, should come in that one particular account okay now be very careful there is a specific date if i if i am purchasing it today in the name of say xyz party you have to encash in 15 days otherwise if you don't encash in 15 days all the amount will go to the pradhan mantri prime minister relief fund okay now be careful if i am donating say 1000 rupees to one particular party they are not encashing it the 1000 will go to the prime minister relief fund there is no provision that it comes back to me that is not a provision so third is also correct okay now who can receive these electoral bond there is also condition statement number 2 only only those political parties will get the donations which are registered under the representative people act yes it's a one mandatory condition every political party needs to be registered and that particular party must have secured at least 1% of the votes polled in the last lok sabha or the state assembly i mean you know guys in india there are more more than 6000 parties there are more than 6000 parties that we have in in india like you know small small bit lot of parties political parties are there but uh, election commission allows the funding through electoral bonds only to those serious parties because we do not want that electoral bonds to be used as a you know as a instrument of the money laundering to check this their misuse we don't want that you know simply for transferring money they are to be used so so to check the misuse of the, of uh, these bonds to check their misuse what they have done they have specified this condition so it is mandatory at least that party must have secured 1% votes uh, of the last lok sabha or the total votes of the state assembly then only you are eligible for these kind of a uh, thing okay for all th three are correct okay now there is statement uh, problem with the statement number 4 statement 4 says all payment for issuing the electoral bonds 
will be accepted in Indian rupees as well as foreign. No, foreign currencies are actually not allowed. Absolutely not allowed the foreign currency. Every transaction, every payment is restricted to Indian rupee. So statement four, four is wrong, eliminate it and rest three are correct. Answer would be C. I mean, this is a very common sense, right? How common sense? I mean, why would you allow foreign currencies to come in, into the political system? We do not want any political, any foreign currency to influence the election process or the political parties of India. So logically, we never allow that. Rest of the things, I would say this, this particular kind of question, I would say, yes, it's a bit difficult question. You need to have a uh, in-depth knowledge of electoral bonds, but I would still say you can uh, attempt it, but you have to read every statement very carefully. I mean, sometimes we read the statement, uh, uh, you know, in a very easy, casual manner. Don't do that in such, and especially, especially if you have like three statement, four statement, five statement, if the question size is long, it's a lengthy question, try to read each and every statement with utmost attention. I'm sure you will find some kind of clue. The, 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 the lengthier the question, you will surely get some clue in these kind of questions and they are of very much use for you guys. Okay. Okay. Question number 56. Now this question was about the government of national capital territory of Delhi Act, which is very much in the news. Very, very important act guys. So what is this GNCTD? This is the short form of the act 2021. Figure out the correct one. First says, as per the act, the expression government referred into any law to be made by assembly shall mean the lieutenant governor. First statement is correct. See, there used to be an act governing the administration of Delhi. That act was 1991 act. The same act, 1991. Now, this recent act was amended and in 2021, now this particular act was actually brought to, you know, clarify what are the duties and the functions of lieutenant governor as well as the elected government? Because you know, in Delhi, Delhi is a UT with state legislature, right? So uh, Delhi has a special status and giving that uh, particular attention, uh, it is always difficult how you, you will uh, clarify, how you will separate the functions and the powers of the lieutenant governor and the government. There is always a kind of tussle. And we all have seen in the present government uh, of Delhi and the lieutenant governor, right? So to segregate their powers and function, this amendment was made. And in this particular act, it was clearly mentioned every single law that the government of Delhi is going to make, that particular law is to be made in the name of lieutenant governor because ultimately it's the nominal head of the state, okay? It is the nominal head of the state. And this is also the practice for a normal state also. Every you know, decision which is taken by the chief minister and the council of minister is taken in the name of governor. So that is the same case here. First statement, correct. Second say, says it mandates the council of minister to obtain the opinion of the LG before taking any executive action on matter falling within the legislative competence of the assembly. Second is also correct. So basically I told you this particular act was made uh, slightly in favor of the LG and lieutenant governor was given kind of good kind of powers and uh, it was this was very much in the news recently I, I hope you guys know that the Supreme Court has also given a verdict Supreme Court gave the verdict in favor of the Delhi government by the way then the central government has recently came, came up with the ordinance and the ordinance has restored the powers to the LG I mean this is a very hot topic and uh, I would say this this is a kind of medium kind of question you must attempt do, do not leave these kind of questions Pay a little bit attention. If you are good with current affairs, you can solve it. Answer would be C. Now, moving ahead with the question number 57. Now, this is a question which is again, it has this question 57 has a relation to the question 56. How it is talking about the triple chain of collective responsibility. It, it was in news recently. What is this triple chain of collective responsibility? Well, this, the uh, you know, in this particular act, the in the New Delhi case, it is the Supreme Court that has clarified, that has uh, made people understand what is this triple chain of collective responsibility. So how the government functions, how, how the functions, uh, the administration and the hierarchy within the government works, that interrelation of each level is called the triple chain of collective responsibility. So we have the civil servants at the bottom level, the civil servants, 
they will report they are going to report to the ministers to their respective ministers right and every minister is going to report to the legislature and legislature is then responsible towards the electorate and that is this hierarchy this particular hierarchy of reporting to their superior is what you call as triple chain of collective responsibility okay now that statement is c is the right answer in this particular case it is it, it is nothing to do with parliament nothing to do with president or something like that it, it has nothing to do with judiciary but who has clarified this the supreme court of india clarified in the same new delhi administrative case okay very very important now question 58 is a match the following kind of statement and this statement says there we have given some elephant reserves and there are state which are mentioned so first is the singh bhum singh bhum which particular state we are talking about and uh, is it odisha it is not odisha i mean this is a question you can only attempt if you are good with a bit of geography and you are bit good with the maps that is the first requirement for solving these kind of questions let's say you do not know much about that particular elephant reserve forget about the elephant reserve for some time apply the common sense of geography where do you have a singh bhum plateau i ho I, i hope you guys remember there is also a plateau by this name there is a singh bhum plateau majority of that plateau is under the state of the jharkhand right even if you remember that you can straight away say okay singh bhum elephant reserve is not odisha it is jharkhand number 1 then we have the singh pan the singh pan uh, the singh pan uh, elephant reserve is not chatisgarh it is it it lies in the northeast of india the state name is the nagaland okay in nagaland we have the singh pan so first and second are not correct third and fourth are okay no problem the third is elephant reserve is agastya malai it is in tamil nadu it is correct by the way it is not exactly tamil nadu i will explain it little bit later if you if you go to the western ghats of india the bottom of the western ghat where the western ghats terminate there you have the agastya malai elephant reserve it it, it is also biosphere reserve so some part of agastya malai lies in tamil nadu but also some part lies in the kerala okay so it lies at the at the juncture of this these two states so third is absolutely correct fourth is terai elephant reserve it's the second elephant reserve of uttar pradesh even in 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 case of terai if you are not able just apply your geographical knowledge the terai is that particular uh, it, it is terai is one of the uh, part of alluvial plains if you have if you have learned about the alluvial plains of northern india then you know then we have the bhabar terai bangad and khadar i'm sure you have learned about that terai are those particular area which are a bit marshy areas and uh, they are those particular areas where you have uh, you know the rivers the rivers flow they are very good uh, for agriculture agriculture rich areas and you you have the terai terai belt is there in uttar pradesh so even applying that particular knowledge you can solve that i would say this particular question was an easy one there is absolutely um, you know nothing challenging it's a straight for forward uh, you know location and elephant reserve the answer would be only two pairs just to give you a bit more insight about it i'm sure if you if you are following the pmfis current affairs and you are following our maps then this these kind of questions becomes a very easy it, is, it becomes a cake walk for you right so here we have a terai elephant reserve this uh, here we have and uh, somewhere this is the singpan in nagaland and we have the agastya malai here at the juncture at the intersection of uh, kerala and tamil nadu and uh, other one was which one this singbhum this is the singbhum in jharkhand this is the map i would recommend you guys practice this map as a homework take the political map of india please practice and mark all the elephant reserves similarly you should do the same exercise for the tiger reserves also both are very important upsc is very fond of asking these kind of questions okay okay ji chalo so let's go with the 59th question the 59th which of the following comes under the ministry of education's comprehensive initiative e pm e vidya so very specific question is being asked you know all these belong to some kind of education that is fine but read the question carefully it's not asking the only the ministry of education within ministry there is a some special initiative called pm e vidya and within that you have to specify these out of these which is a part of p uh, pm e vidya 
what is this uh, pradhan mantri e vidya scheme guys you know, now you can see as it is saying about the e vidya vidya is education e is electronic what is electronic education electronic education is the online education so basically the pm e vidya initiative is to provide the online education to all the people all the students of our country that is the pm vidya initiative okay now diksha portal is definitely a part of it Diksha Vani is also part of it. Diksha portal is uh, ta is talking about all resources which are available. All the resources uh, for for the school students should be available in the online digital mode. That is the Diksha portal. I I'll tell you the detail also. But as of now, the even the Diksha Vani is there. Diksha Vani is uh, specifically for helping out. Uh, you know the courses of uh, it is specifically about Vani. Diksha Vani Vani has something to do with the radio. you know some radio podcast are there there is there is something called as cbsc podcast all that is being operated un under the shiksha vani so mainly the you know radio podcast are there in the shiksha vani and the sathi portal is also there sathi portal is basically to help the students uh, assist the students in in the competitive exams if you are preparing for competitive exam all the resources will be available to you through the sathi portal so 1 3 and 4 are absolutely correct but this particular ullas mission ullas mission is not covered under pm e vidya though it has something to do with education ullas mission talks about providing the basic literacy it is talking about providing basic literacy and basic skills but that is specifically to the people who are 15 year of age and above not like covering something under this particular mission so pm vidya has this there are other missions also there are other uh, you know all other domains also which are covered now this particular kind of question i would say this is a bit difficult question i agree the level is a bit difficult how to approach it if you are not sure i will say please leave it if you are not sure if you have not heard about it please don't go by the trick method there is absolutely no chance you will get the things correct because at least even if you are going for a guess work even for the guess work you need to have at least 2 to 3 as uh, you know sure in your head then only you can go with the guess work otherwise you can simply leave it without any issue okay okay so if i was talking about the pm e, uh, e vidya so please make sure that every portal every initiative is there so i was talking about the diksha platform specifically for school education it has been it it, it this particular uh, app was made okay uh pm vidya also has its own dth tv tv channels there are 12 channels which are again providing you the online content almost 200 uh dth channels are now been made initially 12 now they have become 200 shiksha vani i told you about the cbse podcast and everything and other than that there are other initiatives like we have also the daisy initiative pm vidya is a very broad uh kind of umbrella initiative for online education in india so we have the daisy Uh, you know which is digitally accessible information system is there we have the virtual labs also samagra shiksha is also there sathi portal i told you about the competitive exams ullas please remember the full form it is understanding lifelong learning for all in society but it is not covered as a part of pm vidya okay important question number 60 very straight forward question nothing much into that it it is talking about the national financial reporting authorities the nfra now you have to tell me this is an independent regulator and it comes under which particular ministry basically the nfra is 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 a is a one regulator which is which is all about the auditing professional like how the audits are being taken into into our uh, uh, financial our, our corporates specifically the corporate finances the corporate finances is something which are more subject to violations and all right so this particular national financial reporting authority it actually works under the ministry of corporate affairs i mean i mean i know you guys get a, get a bit of confused it's a financial one and many of you will say oh this is ministry of finance but be careful it is not the finance it is the auditing profession so nfra you might get confused with the ministries and i always tell you be very very careful about the ministries okay nfra is auditing profession and ministry of corporate affairs directly is the in charge of this particular okay
uh, level I would say it's a it's a easy question I mean there is nothing rocket science the level is very easy and you should go for it you can approach these kind of questions easily guys okay very very important and yeah one more few more points I would like to add in the NFRA like for example uh, this particular authority also has a power of the civil court like I mean if there is a requirement uh, it, it is talking about the quality of corporate financing like I told you but even if there is any kind of chance if there is uh, if there is a requirement it is empowered to take the investigation absolutely it can take and it can take the investigation both ways it can also start the in, uh, start the investigation on its own I mean it is independent it can take the investigation on its own also if there is any complaint if there is any reference from the central government if the central government wants it to go and check out the uh, finances of that particular corporate house even that can be done okay and very interestingly this particular authority also has a retrospective authority retrospective authority means you can also even like this particular authority was made 2018 but if it is required it can also go back date it can go back date and check the uh, audits of even the uh, you know the data prior to 2018 that is called retrospective authority you can go into the back dates and that then also you can do the auditing part so that that this is a very interesting authority and it is very mandatory also because corporate financing is something which has uh, the ethical issue so yes to make the corporate financing uh, quite ethical and transparent we need these kind of authorities the next one we have is about the member of the parliament the local area development scheme called the MP LAD scheme you have to figure out which statement is correct first statement says it's a central sector scheme fully funded by the government of India that enables the MPs to recommend developmental work in their constituencies or the states yes this is correct no problem with that second statement says it is administered by ministry of uh, statistical program implementation implemented by district authorities yes so both statements are correct about it MP led is very very important like every member of parliament get a sum of uh, 5 crore rupees okay they get a sum of 5 crore rupees uh, and with this 5 crore and this is every year they get 5 crore rupees every year and uh, with this 5 crore they can recommend the developmental work it is not like they have to do it on their own they, they have to recommend the work they will recommend the developmental work they want in their constituencies and accordingly and very importantly this MP LAD fund this particular fund of 5 crore is non lapsable means if you are not able to uh, you know spend all the 5 crore this year it's okay the remaining part you can spend the next year that that's why it, it uh, you know keeps on adding it's it is non lapsable kind of fund important one more important thing here initially what these MPs used to do sometimes they used to keep the money in the bank account and uh, you know whatever interest comes whatever interest of that 5 crore rupees comes they used to use that also as a supplementary uh, you know fund for their development scheme but now very clearly the ministry of finance has said the interest whatever if, if in case you are not spending your money and whatever interest you can't use it for developmental work the interest has to be deposited in the consolidated fund of India okay very very interesting this uh, recent development that has taken place now also in this in the case of the MP there is uh, there is a very interesting part if the if there is member of parliament for the Lok Sabha you can spend or you can recommend the development work of your own constituency which because you are elected from that one constituency if you are member of the parliament of the Rajya Sabha then of course you can uh, suggest developmental work in your own state own state matlab from the state that you are being selected as a member of parliament not one constituency entire state if you are if you are a, if you are nominated member if you are a nominated member of parliament be it Lok Sabha or Rajya Sabha both ways then you can select the developmental area from the whole of country from all over India you can select like where, like where you would want to spend uh, this particular money so that also important because every bit elected or bit nominated all member of parliament get this particular grant so answer has to be C I would say it's it is a very easy kind of question guys it is easy and the even if you know the basics of the MP lad you can simply uh, solve it without any challenge into that 
The next question is about the fifth and the sixth schedule. Now this is very very important. Again there are four statements so read every statement very very carefully. Fifth and sixth schedules are something which are always in the news for one reason or the other. So you have to be very very careful about it. The question says the fifth schedule provides establishment of the tribes advisory council which is called the TAC council in every state having scheduled areas and the sixth schedule provides formation of the ADC which is autonomous district council and regional council is specifically in the northeast area. See guys fifth and sixth both schedules are talking about the tribal area administration that is at least this much is clear be it fifth schedule or sixth both are talking about the tribal welfare both are talking about the tribal population the ST population of our country but there is some difference with the fifth and the sixth guys when it comes to, to the sixth schedule it is specifically specifically made for the northeastern states and which particular states are covered is the ATMM state means uh, Assam, Tripura, Meghalaya, Mizoram only these four states are there and in these particular states wherever there is a tribal area every tribal area is going to have its own auto, non autonomous district council and there they can make their own laws about certain uh, subjects okay they, they can make this their local laws also there but in the fifth schedule it is other than these four states any other state of India having a tribal area uh, is a, having a scheduled area there we have to make a tribal advisory council so absolutely correct first statement there is no problem with the first one second statement says the governor of the state having scheduled area empowered to direct that any particular act of the parliament shall not apply to that area with such exceptions modifications yes absolutely see the governor has a lot of power in terms of scheduled areas basically guys the scheduled areas are under the overall control of the president of India please be careful it is the it is the president of India that has the ultimate responsibility of manage, managing the scheduled area right then of course president control the scheduled area or develop the scheduled area through the governor that is the practice okay so governor ultimately decide which particular act of the parliament is going to get applied there in tribal area because tribal areas are supposed to have their own administration right that is why the coordination between the central government and the tribal area uh, councils it is done by the governor governor is a connecting link it's, it's a bridge between the two so second is also correct third says the tribes advisory council consul, uh, constitutional body advises governor on on the matter welfare yes that is also correct so if, if you know the a bit of basic even if you know a little basic of fifth and sixth you can straight away solve every single of that right so yes i would say the answer has to be d all the four are correct the fifth schedule empower governor make recommendations yes they can do that there is no issue so level is i would say it's a medium it's a bit of medium but i i think you can solve this question with the very basic knowledge of fifth and sixth schedule having said that now my suggestion for your upcoming exam is do take care of one thing guys there are total 12 schedules in our constitution i would recommend you guys at least read each schedule you should be aware which particular schedule is about what particular provision so at least have a reading before you go to your exam about these particular schedules the so question 63 was about the governor and its discretionary power very very important question now you have to tell me which statement is the correct one statement one says the governor can act at its own discretion only in the matter where the constitution express expressively uh, provides it yes 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 what is the discretionary power see normally what happens the governor is bound by the aid and advice of the council of minister right it is the aid and advice of the council of minister that governor has to follow there are certain situations where governor is not supposed to follow what the council of ministers are saying in some special situations it is the governor that has to take decision with his own will without under the control of council of minister and that particular power is called the discretionary power its own autonomous power but it's not like governor can do anything with the discretionary power no in constitution under the article 163 it's been specifically mentioned 
in what situations governor has to act with a discretionary power on its own and situations for example it is governor discretionary power where it is his own decision if he wants to reserve a bill for the consideration of the president so in that particular case it is his own discretion guys second situation could be it it if he, if he has to recommend that in this particular state if there is a requirement of the president rule or not the president rule is required under the article 356 so president rule can only be applied if the governor is asking for it okay so it is it is governor's discretion he has to recommend and that he can do with his discretionary power so these are two examples so of course his discretion is binded by the constitution itself so first statement is correct now second says the governor decision on whether matter falls within discretion or not is final and can't be challenged in the court this statement is absolutely wrong i mean governor is not going to have this much power uh, of course the decision uh, of the governor is going to be challenged it is subjected to judicial review so his decisions are not immune from judicial review the court will decide ultimately that what he thinks about the matter as a discretionary or not again it will be validated by the judiciary if there is any conflict so second is not correct first is correct answer has to be c i mean i would say it's a very easy question if even even if you have uh, read once you have read about any good polity book you can easily answer this question absolutely go attempt it no problem with that okay ji chalo moving ahead with the next one question 64 now 64 is something which is very much in the news these days everyone is talking about ed ed enforcement directorate very important so let's try to understand and solve this question on the ed and you have to figure out which statement is the correct one ed is a multidisciplinary organization yes it is multidisciplinary uh, we have the officers from various rank from various departments we have the irs officers here we have the ips officers here we also have officers from other local police local local authorities so ed is a multidisciplinary organization absolutely good and it is mandated it has to investigate the offenses of the money laundering yes it does audit the money laundering cases and the foreign exchange violation so basically one thing you have to remember the enforcement directorate in india is mandated compulsorily has to implement the three most important schemes when it comes to money laundering and foreign exchanges for money laundering it is the pamla act which is prevention of money laundering act 2002 ed has to take care that there should not be any money laundering money laundering as in there should not be any black money uh, that is being generated and it is being converted into white money that is money laundering he has, they have to stop it is the responsibility of the ed similarly we have the fema fema is uh, foreign exchange management act which was 1999 so even fema they have to implement the FAMA. Very recently, 2018, one more, uh, you know, one more duty is assigned to the ED, and that is in the case of the fugitive economic offender bill. Who is fugitive economic offender? People like Vijay Malia, people like Nirav Modi. So those people who have done some economic fraud in India and they are economic offender and they have left the country and got settled somewhere else this is called fugitive economic offender so even the implementation of these people is the responsibility of the of the ed okay so first statement is absolutely correct second says it is under ministry of home affair no it is not absolutely not many people think like it it is under the home ministry it's a it is probably the biggest misconception guys ed works under ministry of finance it is Ministry of Finance and to be more specific, it is the Department of Revenue. It is the Department of the Revenue under which it functions. So yeah, this is wrong. It can take a case, Suomoto, no, it cannot take cases on its own. Suomoto is on its own. It can't take the case on its own. There has to be a complaint. I mean, the complaint can be done by any central agency, CBI or NIA or something like that. Only then the cases can be taken up. So second is incorrect, third incorrect, fourth it says the enforcement case information report very similar to the FIR shared with, with the accused. No, you can't share the ECIR. So under this ED, there is something called enforcement case information report. It is similar to the FIR, but it is very, very confidential document. 
it should never ever be shared with the accused because it has all the information like the, uh, the it has information about the accused the offense that is being done who are the witnesses the evidences so a lot of confidential information is there and it is never to be shared with the accused or to any public authority only the court can see it during the case so second third fourth incorrect answer would be one only and you must prepare this topic guys uh, because uh, upsc can ask you these kind of questions and uh, very very important topic also and very much into the news also guys okay now question number 65 was about the high sea treaty uh, now this is again a very important topic about the high sea treaty what is this all about you have to figure out the correct one high sea treaty is legally binding instrument for the conservation sustainable use of marine biological diversity in the area beyond national jurisdiction also called the bnj what is beyond national jurisdiction you have to figure out this what is a high sea first of all try to understand that so very interestingly if this is the coastline of a country if this is the coastline of a country so from that coast line the distances are measured you know and within uh, it, it talks about different different zones that we have within the maritime zones so from the coastline the first 12 meters 12 nautical miles is what you call as the territorial sea the from the coastline the next 24 nautical miles is what you call as the contiguous zone cz contiguous zone from the coastline only if you go in towards the water if you go till 200 nautical mile then you call this as exclusive economic zone now be very careful distance which is after 200 nautical mile one nautical mile is approximately 1.8 of the kilometer right so any body any water which is beyond exclusive economic zone now this particular water is called the international water also called the high sea it is called the high sea because it is international water because or high sea because no country has exclusive jurisdiction here none of the country's laws implement at this particular this is purely like this is neutral waters no country has any control over these waters and that is why that is why it is important to have a high sea territory and which particular organization does all this demarcation it is the united nation convention laws of the sea it is the only body legitimate body that actually make rules and guidelines how you are supposed to utilize your adjoining waters so unca laws is a very important treaty so yes second is correct first is also correct guys and and uh, uh, one more thing here the international uh, waters the high sea is important because you have a lot of mineral resources in fact two third of the total ocean comes as a component of the high sea high sea is of course it's it's large it's huge so all two third of the ocean is part of the high sea third statement is also correct because the high sea treaty also aims to place 30 percent of the world international water into protected areas yes this treaty talks about creating lots of marine marine conservation parks and they are going to protect the area of the oceans 30 percent of the total area uh, they are going to conserve it protect by 2030 so all three are correct in my opinion answer has to be d uh, this is uh, i would say this is a bit medium medium because first second are absolutely okay you can solve with the common sense even if you know a bit of, of the high c you can solve it but i mean these targets are too specific i mean it can be 20 percent 15 percent 30 percent of course this is something that you should know if you do not know this fact then try to go with the elimination method suppose you are not very sure about it then at least try the elimination method out of three if you know the two statements i think elimination become a bit easy guys that you can follow right okay moving ahead with the next one uh, which is our question number 66 now very simple question now this is a purely map based question it says now you have the five countries here how many of the above countries are included in the drainage basin of a Congo river? Congo river basin is important because this is the second largest ocean, uh, uh, you know, river basin in the world. The first being Amazon. Amazon is the largest, second is the Congo. 
you have to you have to tell me which which of the country is a part of that uh, river drainage basin by the way what is the meaning of a drainage basin drainage basin means if i have this one particular river so area which is drained area which is covered or drained by the main river and even its tributaries all the tributaries so this whole area will be called as a drainage basin area covered by drained by the main river and all its territories so taking that definition into consideration think about the congo river its drainage basin and you will see angola is there zambia is there tanzania is there uh, uganda is not there uh, central african republic is there now it is better i show you show you the uh, congo basin on the map then you will understand it better so please look at this congo uh, congo river basin map you see the river congo here very clearly mentioned okay so congo river is something which is flowing you see the country zambia is covered tanzania is covered it, it is also part of the congo river basin then you have the democratic republic of the congo in between then you also have the republic of the congo in here but please be careful uh uganda is quite aloof you see this particular country guys uganda is clearly not a part of it not part of or not not part of it it is part of nile river uganda has its connection with the nile river but not with the congo river very important okay and one more thing i would like to talk about that congo is the only river in africa that actually crosses equator twice if you look at this fact the uh, congo river crosses the equator twice so be this is another important fact angola is also part of this particular river basin so these are very straightforward questions i mean of course you can't do any guesswork for this you really have to be good with the maps i would suggest the more time you spend with the maps it is better for you because ultimately these are very surprising kind of questions i would always recommend you guys please never do the guesswork in the map based questions they are very factual you do not know it then you don't attempt it at please okay i would say the level is easy but easy for those who have good understanding and they have good command over the maps otherwise don't attempt these kind of questions question 66 was about the anti defection law now what this question is about you have to figure out the statement a correct statement anti defection law this law introduced by constitution 52nd amendment 18, 1985 to curb the unprincipled unethical political defections yes what is anti defection what is a defection by the way defection is when you are elected on the ticket of one particular party and later on you are leaving your party you are changing your side you are moving to other political party that is called defection now as per 52nd amendment 1985 because that time is it was a very common practice that you know a lot of mps and mla used to swing between the parties one party they used to change to another one and also there was a lot of money involved there was a lot of horse trading which was involved which was buying and uh, selling of the member of parliament and member of legislative assemblies i mean to stop these kind of corrupt practices in politics this anti defection law was made and today it is part of our 10th schedule if you go and read the it is the part of the 10th schedule that is anti defection law first is correct second says anti defection law empower the president to decide the dif- disqualification of the member on ground if let's say anybody has done the defection then it is not the domain of president guys anti defection powers are within the speaker of the house it is within the speaker of the lok sabha in case of parliament or uh, legislative assembly in case of your and also the, the defection can be done because even the in the rajya sabha it can be done no so even the chairperson of the rajya sabha that has the power basically whosoever is presiding officer of the house they have the ultimate power they will decide if this kind of defection is going to be disqualified the member is is going to be disqualified or not very important and one more thing one more thing though the decisions are final again whatever decision speaker will make that is final for that but again the uh, this kind of disqualification is also subjected to judicial review i mean you can go to the supreme court if you think the disqualification is not justified you can go and appeal so that anti defection judgments are also subjected to the judicial review that you take care into account so second is not correct it is a speaker not uh, the president first is correct the third says anti defection amended in uh, 2020 2003 remove the exception for the split and merger yes again very interesting you know there was a time when uh, the original act said okay if there is one third let's say if there is a party of 100 people 
and 33 people decided to go and switch their side. This one third split of the political party will be considered as a merger of the other political party. So in that case, you know, there should not be any kind of disqualification. But this was again something, it was a loophole in the act. Lot of times what used to be done, lot of members collectively used to switch. Then again, it will cause a very political, uh, you know, instability in the government. And that is why to fix that particular thing, the government of India has later removed this. So there is this one third also switch that is, that is still considered to be as defection. Now they have amended it. Now it has to be two third. If two third members are moving and going, then only should, it should be considered as a merger, not as a defection. Okay, now that requirement is changed from one third to two third. First and third are correct. Second, not correct answer has to be C, one and three. I hope you, are, you have understood. Now this particular question, I would say, this is also very easy. This is, this is not difficult at all. If you have read even once about entity defection, you can solve it straight away without any issue, guys. Next question we are going to uh, talk about is the deep ocean mission of the India. Now, what is this deep mission ocean of India? You have to figure out the correct one. First says it's the first manned ocean mission of India exploring exclusively on the high sea area. Now, caution, red flag, be cautious. It is, say, it is saying we are going to explore exclusively means only the high sea. Don't, don't you see there is some kind of suspicion here? If I have to plan my ocean mission, why would I only go and explore the high sea? Of course, even the high before the high sea, I have my own exclusive economic zone also. No? So by default, these kind of missions are planned on a larger scale. So in this deep ocean mission of India, we are going to explore the economic uh, exclusive economic zone of India also, along with the high sea, not the exclusive high sea. That's why first statement has a bit of issue. So first statement is wrong. Second statement is also wrong. Why? It says deep mission, deep ocean mission. It is implemented by Ministry of Science and Tech. No, it is not Ministry of Science and Tech. It is the Ministry of the Earth Sciences. See guys, just to make you understand, every research on the ocean, it is all under the domain of Earth Sciences. Now, Science and Tech has, there is absolutely no mission on ocean which is done by any other ministry than Ministry of Earth Sciences. So remember it, very, very important. Okay. And uh, third statement says the, this again UNCLOS is the, is the legal regime controlling the resource uh, exploitation on the deep sea bedded area. Yes, it is there. Third is one. So only one is correct. So because it is ultimately this particular treaty, the UNCLOS, they only allow if, if any country has to go and do the exploration of the deep sea. What deep sea beds have a lot of lots of uh, minerals, a lot of uh, mineral wealth is there specifically in terms of the polymetallic nodules polymetallic nodules where you have you where you have uh, you know uh, almost a feast size of small small deposits they are the precipitates we have and lots of uh, what you say a uh, lot of small small minerals a lot of metallic minerals are there in one polymetallic nodule you get lots of metals uh, as one they are being you know they are the one in one particular polymetallic, you have manganese, cobalt. This is this is very important, and it is the it is mainly the polymetallic nodule which are being explored in the deep sea, along with other things also. Not the only one, of course, but uh, the answer has to be one. Now, if I go a bit ahead, now this is about the likely consequences of the El Nino. This this question is important again, very important. So it uh, uh, if you like yesterday also we had a bit discussion on the consequences of the El Nino. You know what is the El Nino, right? El Nino is the warm water. El Nino is the warm current that replaces the normal casual Peru current. In normal situation, if you see, if let's say this is your Australia and this is your South America. Now, please let's listen to me very carefully. This is your South America. Along the South America, on the western side, you have a cold current called the Peru current. Normally, we have the cold current here. And on the other side, this side, we have the East Australian current, which is a warm current. Okay. <clears throat> In normal situation, the pressure on the, because of the cold, cold uh, current, the South American side, this particular, uh, you know, coastline has a temperature, which is low temperature. And that's why it has a high pressure. Okay. And Australia, because of the presence of the East Ocean warm current, it's a warm current. 
it has its low temp uh, it, it has a high temperature and that's why it has a low pressure and you know how the winds will flow from high to low so normal conditions are every wind flow is going to be in this direction from high to low and it will complete the circle it will come this particular way so that is how the whole everything is going to happen okay i i, I let me correct it wait it has to be this way so ground surface has to be there and then it goes this particular way i hope you are aware because ultimately it is the surface one that we have to decide the whole convention will go automatically now this particular kind of circulation is called the walker cell it's a normal scenario it's a non elino year it's a normal year so but but then comes the elino part whenever the, you have the elino current which is a warm motion current from the from the equatorial waters you know this warm current flows down and replaces this one uh, peru current which is the cold current it is completely replaced by the el nino and you see the every every condition changes here guys after the el nino appearance the warm current comes you see this particular area of south american coast are going to witness high temperature and it will have a low pressure lower even lower than what used to be at the australian australian one so the whole circle reverses now after the el nino you see you will have this i mean this complete reversal of the winds will start taking place and you will have everything going in the reverse direction then it becomes the modified walker cell the whole complete reverse one and that is where the el nino kicks in and this is happening in the pacific waters guys and el nino then you have all the things which is happening so it's a this is the el nino phenomena by the, I, i hope that is clear to you so what are the consequences of the el nino increase rainfall flooding in the in the parts of south america particularly peru and equatorial yes, of course because we have i have just told you we are going to have low pressure at the south american coast na because of the presence of the low pressure we have the rainfall and flooding droughts reduce water availability in south africa yes this is also the case because it is ultimately going to break the normal wind patterns everything will be reversed then it says disrupted ocean current leading to colder sea surface temperatures and reduced rainfall in parts of australia of course the rainfall will get reduced normal situation australia used to, used to get more rainfall right but because of the modified walker cell the whole circulation is towards south america south america is going to be more rain and the whole australia is going to be bit of dry because there is absolutely reversal so first second third is correct but there is problem with the fourth one now fourth is not absolutely correct why because fourth statement says because of the el nino intensified tropical cyclones increase coastal flooding in the indian ocean i told you majority of the things the major impact of the el nino is restricted to the pacific ocean i mean for the indian ocean the cyclones and other coastal flooding there are other factors which are responsible not the el nino guys so 1 2 3 only 3 are correct answer has to be this i have i have very quickly tried to explain you how this uh, all el nino thing uh, works i hope you are pretty clear now with this now comes the next question which is question number 70 now 70 question is about the national financial reporting authority we have already done that if you remember uh, there was a previous question about the nfra there it was asking the ministry now you have a full fledged question NFRA independent regulator established under the Companies Act oversee the auditing financial reporting standards in India yes i already told you guys it has the power to investigate impose penalties on auditors companies for violation accounting yes it can and i also told you it has the power of a civil court i told you it can also start its uh, you know investigation on its own or after a complaint also so it it has both the powers it also has a regressive uh, regressive uh, you know Uh, uh powers where it can go beyond 2018 and can also uh, start the auditing part third statement says nfra recommend recommend accounting and auditing standards of the central board for approval but final decision rest with the cbic no the third statement is wrong yes it is correct the nfra recommend the auditing uh, standards accounting standards that is fine but the final decision is not with the cbic the final decision remains with the ministry of finance okay it is with the ministry of finance not with the uh, cbic or something it is not with them so that you have to be careful about oh, sorry so, sorry ministry of corporate affairs not ministry of finance ministry of the corporate affairs ministry of the corporate affairs has to take the final decision okay that is important 
uh, third fourth statement says that it is going to replace the institute of no it is not going to replace of course we have institute of chartered accountant of india this particular institute is responsible uh, for the for the professional conduct of the ca all the chartered accountants they are controlled by this their professional conduct is con uh, is controlled by this their education their exam all this responsibility is with the institute chartered accountant of india but the nfra has altogether different domain it its job is to uh, you know make guidelines standard for the auditing and financial reporting so two things are very different it is not going to replace any institute so fourth is also wrong answer has to be b only two is the right answer okay that is again important now if you look at the question number 71 again very very important question guys question 71 and what it says question 71 is about the coronal mass ejection cmes how many statements are correct you have to figure out first statement says cmes are large eruptions of highly charged plasma from so sun's corona that can travel towards earth disrupting tech and communication system right first you need to know what is a cor coronal mass ejections if you look at the sun sun has the inner part and the outer part and the outer part has the three layers the first layer called the uh, the photosphere the second layer is what you call as the chromosphere the outermost part of the sun is what you call as the corona layer corona is the hottest it is the hottest layer of the sun okay hottest means i mean approximately 2.2 uh, you know million degree celsius that is the kind of temperature we have at the outer part of the sun now sun from this corona there is continuously uh, there is ejection of the plasma there is continuously ejection of the solar plasma and that solar plasma you know that is uh, that is called that is the charged particles that's that's highly charged plasma it is highly charged plasma and that comes towards the earth and that is what you call as the solar flare we also call it as solar flare and this solar flare is also called as the coronal mass ejections so all these charged highly charged plasma particles they are bombarded towards the earth whenever they come they always disrupt our tech and communication system because they impact the ionosphere the most ionosphere is the one impacted the most by these okay and so they are not very good for our tech and communication system so first is correct but the second statement is something wrong here it says all coronal mass ejections directly impact of course not it is not possible i mean Uh, earth receives only 1/5 billionth part of the uh, uh, you know sun's energy all cmes are not going to impact the earth of course there are majority which will miss it only small part is going to impact but the impact is quite great but not all the cmes so every time you see the word all only every time you have to read the statement twice okay this is this is important so here the second statement is wrong first is correct a uh, third statement says the strength and the direction of the cmes can be predicted with a complete accuracy allowing for effective mitigation measure that is also not something we have achieved i mean scientists are trying hard uh, yes a bit of direction and strength we can still figure out but you can't you can't do that with accuracy you can't uh, particularly say okay this ejection is going to hit this particular part of the earth i mean this much accuracy is something which is still missing and we are not able to do that so second and third and this is again very common sense you can apply very easy question you can simply see there are extremes when in any question if you have any if you find any kind of extreme that you can simply rule out that this is not correct uh, because i see something extreme in that so be very careful with these statements uh, upsc always give you clues within the questions so you have to take those clues okay so only one statement is correct in this particular case there is a, in your pdf there is a diagram of the sun also you can you can uh, see that you can you will understand what is a solar flare and coronal mass ejections now question number 72 was about the dark patterns okay very very important dark pattern is there so which statement is correct you have to figure out first statement says the dark patterns are intentionally deceptive user interface and user experiences designs that manipulate user into something that otherwise it will not do deceptive patterns manipulate consumer choice and impede their right to be well informed constitute an unfair practice under the consumer protection act both statements are absolutely correct what is a dark pattern 
I'm sure you guys, whenever you do the surfing on the internet, you know, while doing the surfing on the internet, some pop-up windows show up, no? Some pop-up windows come on your screen. And when you try to cancel those pop-up window, you find really uh, hard. You, it's, it's very struggling, you know, uh, to get to, you know, close them down. The pop-up information is very simple. Now, these are the kind of things which are intentionally, you know, bombarded towards you and to make you click those links because that is something you do not want to do. But ultimately, in trying of closing them down, minimizing them down, you somewhere click something on them and then you are redirected to altogether new window or new website or something like that. Yes. Well, that is what you call as a dark pattern. It is, it is, it decepts you. It make you click certain things which otherwise you do not want to do that. And it is very, very common practice today in the, in the area where especially we are surfing on the internet. So any, any suspicious link you should never ever click. They take, they can take the information and you never know what kind of impact it can have on you. First is correct. And yes, it is absolutely unfair practice and the Consumer Protection Act 2019 covers it exclusively and there is punishment for that. So both statements being correct, answer is quite, uh, I think the level is easy. I will not say difficult. See in UPSC, the questions are not difficult. In UPSC, it is the, it is the options that are actually difficult, not the questions guys, important, right? Okay, ji, chalo, moving ahead. Question number 73. Now this uh, question 73 was about which of the following countries is the founding member of the CSTO, which is Collective Security Treaty Organization. Nowadays looking for the Western political economic integration by deepening its ties with the NATO. Now this is very interesting guys. Now uh, uh, on, the, on the power map of the world, you have USA on one side, you have the Russia on the other side, okay? So during the times of the Cold War, when Russia, when uh, 1949, USA made NATO, USA, uh, you know, started this NATO treaty as a, as a defense against USSR. Russia also started something called CSTO. CSTO is very much similar to what NATO is. In, in CSTO, you have members like Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Armenia is also one of them. Right? These are the countries. Now, the answer here is B, by the way. It is Armenia these days, which is actually a member of CSTO, but now Armenia is leaning towards NATO, wants to join, wants to have their good friendship also. And why Armenia is doing it, that is also very interesting. You should know the reason also. These days, the majority of the foreign policy of Armenia is guided due to the conflict it has with, with the country called Azerbaijan, right? So Azerbaijan is one country which is having a conflict over one particular area called the Nagarno, the Nagarno Karabakh. I'm sure you have heard about it. I think this was asked in 2023 UPSC prelims also, Nagarno Karabakh region. So that is why they are also a bit, you know, moving towards having goodwill of this country because uh, Azerbaijan has good relation with the West. So that's why the policy is being done like that. These are tricky questions. These are fact-based questions. Never ever, never ever, there, there should not be no guesswork here. The level is, I would say, medium. It can be difficult also in case you are not aware of that. So kindly leave these kind of questions if you are not 100% sure. Because there is absolutely no way you can do the guesswork. And in my opinion, 99% of your guesswork will go wrong. Because the questions are very tricky. So be very careful while attempting these kind of questions. Question number 74 is about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You have to tell me which statement is correct. SCO permanent intergovernmental body founded in 2001. Yes, it is correct. And the headquarter we have is at Beijing. So Beijing is where the headquarter of the SCO are there. Yes, the both statements are correct. Okay. Uh, the second statement says it is governed by the head of the state of the council, HSC which meet binally. Now that this is the problem guys. The statement uh, second is wrong. Yes, it uh, the SCO is governed by head of the state council. That is fine. But the meeting is not binal. There is an annual meeting that take place. Okay. SCO is annual meeting. So second is not correct. Third says it there is no official language of the SCO. No, there are two languages which are official. Uh, Chinese language and the Russian languages both are the official language of the SCO. 
Now, SCO is important because recently they have added Iran into their group. So it's now it is a group of now that uh, the total there are nine members including India. India was also made a member of SCO as a permanent member in 2017. That makes this particular organization very very important. Of course, China dominates it in certain ways, but for India also it is important. So answer has to be A. Only one is the right answer, guys. Remaining two are wrong in this case. Last question is about the organization, and we have the headquarters. Now, which statement is correctly matched? You have to figure out. The first statement says Asian Infrastructure uh, Bank, which is also called the AIIB. Now, is the headquarter we have in Shanghai? Now, just very be very very careful about it. Uh, do we have the headquarters in Shanghai? Asia Development Bank (ADB) is it Manila? It is Manila, absolutely. Uh, as far as Asia Pacific Economic is concerned, Asia Pacific Economic. See, Shanghai is also not right. Right, I think it is Beijing. It is the Beijing where you have the uh, you know headquarters of AIB. Shanghai, so we have headquarters of the New Development Bank (NDB). NDB, which is part of BRICS. So NDB is the one having headquartered Shanghai. AIB has it as uh, in Beijing. And uh, so first is wrong. Second is wrong. Oh, sorry. Second is right. Second ADB is Manila. Manila is right. Mani Manila is the capital of Philippines. It is the capital of Philippines. So all these banks are basically the multilateral development banks. Okay, very important banks. Every bank is an important bank. Well, third says Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. By the way, it does not have any headquarter. There is it does not have any permanent headquarter. Every year, the Secretariat member holds its meeting. The permanent Secretariat is there, but not permanent headquarter in New York. So third is also wrong. But you should also know a bit about the AIIB. It is uh, it is the one having China. As the largest share, guys, in AIIB, the China has the largest share, approximately 26-27 percent, followed by India being the second largest, um, uh, you know, uh, share having the share in AIIB. ADB is the bank which is having Japan and US both having the highest stake, followed by the China, followed by the China, and then we have the India. That is the scenario with the ADB. All these banks are important. Their headquarters are again very important. So in this case, one three wrong, two is correct. Answer has to be A. Level of difficulty, I would say, of course, it's a fact-based question. If you are not aware, don't attempt. If you are sure, then only go for these kind of questions. So that is all from my side, guys. Uh, in these twenty-five uh, questions, I really hope you have enjoyed and learnt a lot from this video discussion. So see you guys in the next part where I will be discussing the remaining twenty-five uh, questions from the test number one. If in case you have still not attempted these questions, there's a link down below. Go to that and uh, subscribe to the test series of PMFIS. Well, these are the kind of questions. These this is the level of the question you will find in our test series. You can you have seen for yourself. Go attempt it and try to clear UPSC with the flying colors. And this test series is definitely going to help you out, guys. Signing off. See you tomorrow with the part number four. Take care. God bless you. Jai Hind.